this video, we're going to mostly look at one-dimensional unsteady heat conduction. I'm going to use a numerical method to go through an example of numerical unsteady one-dimensional numerical heat transfer. And while we do that, I will briefly introduce the numerical method, but the video on numerical one-dimensional heat transfer has far more details than that. If you're interested in that, you should review that video. The whole while we're doing this, I want you to think about the physics of heat transfer, and for that reason, I'm going to give a brief two-dimensional sample after the one-dimensional example in order to help develop our physical understanding of unsteady heat conduction. The problem I'm going to think about is a one-dimensional slab of material of length L, and we're going to put a constant heat flux or heat rate in at the left surface, and we're going to have a convection coefficient and ambient temperature at the right surface. Uh, we're going to assume one-dimensional conduction, so it's perfectly insulated on these surfaces. I'm going to assume for now it has a constant cross-sectional area, though that would be very easy to change, and that the conductivity is constant, which also would be easy to relax using a numerical method if we wanted to. The method, of course, is to break it up into a number of finite control volumes. So here I have seven control volumes, five of them being complete control volumes of dimension delta x, and the two at the boundaries having a dimension delta x over two are being half volumes. Now we'll be able to derive using conservation of energy the general equation for conservation of energy in each of these interior volumes and again for each of these boundaries. But this is an unsteady problem and so we need to solve it for each and every time step. And in order to solve at any given time step, we need to know the time before it. So to start this problem at time equals zero, we're going to need to know the temperature, the initial condition, the temperature at each point over the entire piece. Once we know that, we can solve for the next time step and once we know the next time step, we can use that to solve for the subsequent time step. So what we're doing here really is solving our system repeatedly once for each time step. When we put it together for this specific system, we have these five interior volumes. There's seven volumes in total, and so we get a seven by seven uh, matrix, which we can solve for. All of these things are known. All of these coefficients are known. If you look at these, we see that because we're approximating conduction using two points, that each and every one of these, let's look at control volume one, which is in the first row of our matrix. Of course, control volume one is going to involve conduction uh, from control volume zero. And so we see this conduction term and this coefficient resulting from co conduction appearing in the T zero. And likewise, it involves conduction from temperature 2, and so we see a conduction to a coefficient appearing there as well. We have conduction and storage over the entire volume, and so we see those coefficients arising from the conduction with each of these, as well as from the storage appearing in that central coefficient, and of course we see the storage related to the previous time step on the B side. When we look at the boundary conditions, we can see it's very similar, except of course at the inlet boundary there is no previous temperature, there, uh, there is no previous control volume, there's no entry in our matrix, and so all we see is the coefficient at control volume 1 appearing for that conduction term there, and similarly at the last control volume we see a coefficient for the conduction between the second last control volume and nothing but our boundary condition appearing in the B side, similarly for the first one our boundary condition, and our energy storage term, the volume, is half for each of these. So you'll notice our volume term, AC delta X is the volume, is divided by 2 in each of these half volumes in each of these terms. So we can solve that now for every single time step, and let's get back to thinking about the physics of the problem. Uh, but first, I've developed a function in Python in order to do this, and I've assumed that it's a rectangular section, so it has a width W into the screen, a height, uh, a length, it has a constant Q in, which would very easily make vary with time. Likewise, it has a T infinity, which is assumed constant here, but could easily be made to vary with time. We have to give it the initial condition so we can start the solving process. And we've assumed rho CP is a constant, the volumetric heat capacity, the conductivity, the convection coefficient, the vector of all the times at which we're going to calculate the solution, and, and the number of control volumes we're going to use. So I've chosen these values. I'm going to put 100 watts into the bar at the x equals 0 surface. I've taken it to be 1 meter into the screen, 0.1 meters in height, and a length of 1 meter. So this is a fairly substantial piece of aluminum. You can expect that it's going to take some time to heat this up. I've used the properties of aluminum, the volumetric heat capacity coming from multiplying the density and the heat capacity per unit math, mass, 
and I've taken the conductivity of aluminum, and I've taken it at 300 degrees. Really, we could adjust that once we see our solution and see that it's rising up to a higher temperature than 300, and we'll look for the average between the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature as a good approximation or a reasonable approximation of the constant value we're assuming over the range of interest. But fair enough to take it at 300 which is really our initial temperature. Hopefully the temperature variations are not that large and it's reasonable to assume. Uh, I'm going to take the initial condition to be in equilibrium. The bar is at the same temperature as the ambient. I've got a convection coefficient of 100 watts per meter squared Kelvin and I'm using 81 control volumes to solve my problem. This results in a thermal diffusivity of 9.7 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second and a biot number of 0 0.422. 0 0.422 is much larger than is acceptable for the lumped capacitance method and so we can expect that there's going to be temperature variations within this bar. So here's how we call the function with all of these variables. It's going to give us back the temperature distribution as a function of time as well as uh, the x coordinates that we're plotting those temperatures at or the control volume centers. So initially there's a very strong curvature because we have to have this slope here corresponding to 100 watts coming in which will always be 100 watts coming in and energy hasn't propagated all the way here. So we have to have this strong curvature in here as energy is propagating to the end. It has to heat up the end before energy starts going out. So as this goes up, this curvature gets smaller and smaller until we reach the steady state solution where we know that we have to have 100 watts going in and 100 watts going out, which means this has to be a straight line. You can also see here that there's a 10 degree difference at the steady state solution between the ambient and the end of the bar. And of course, with a convection coefficient of 100, and these dimensions, that's exactly what you need in order to support carrying 100 watts out of this bar. We can look in detail at the time variation of the temperature. I'm looking here at the temperature at the start of our bar and the temperature at the end of our bar. Of course, as soon as we have a heat flux going in, the temperature at the, begin at the, at the start goes up in order to give us the temperature gradient that must be there for 100 watts to go in right at the beginning. That heat flux going in is the conduct minus the conductivity times that slope. That's always got to be equal to that constant value for 100 watts to be going in. And uh, it takes a while for the energy to propagate in a bit before we raise the temperature at the end here, and we start to see the temperature at the end going up. Of course, in both cases, eventually they're going to reach their steady state condition and no longer change. Let's look at the energy balance. We can calculate the energy balance. We know we have 100 watts going in. And some of that energy is going into energy storage to raise the temperature of the material in this bar. And some of it is eventually going to go out, the, uh, out at x equals 1. And so the sum of the storage and the energy out needs to be 100 watts that we know is what's coming in. So initially, there's a small region where there's no energy going out because we haven't heated up the, the end of the bar yet. And so the energy storage term is entirely 100 watts. As we propagate to the end, when we start to raise the temperature a little bit, there's a small heat flux out of here. And of course, that decreases the energy storage. And as the temperature at the end goes up, the energy, the energy going out increases, and the energy storage decreases. Eventually, the storage has to go down to zero when we reach our steady state solution, where energy in is 100 watts, and the energy out is 100 watts. If we zoom in on the early times, so now this scale is in seconds, it looks like it's approximately a thousand seconds that it takes for the energy to propagate across this bar before we start to see energy going out and the corresponding energy storage uh, to decrease. What if alpha is increased? Alpha is the ratio of the conductivity to the volumetric heat capacity. And that means that it's related to the ease at which energy is transported in the material versus energy is stored in the material. So if we increase alpha, we're increasing the ability of the material to transport energy relative to the amount of energy that's required to raise its temperature or the energy storage. And so I've increased this by an order of magnitude. Before we had 9 point, alpha was 9.71 times 10 to the minus 5. I've increased it to 9.71 times 10 to the minus 4. And I plotted both of these plots again, the temperature at x equals 0 and the temperature at x equals 1, as well as the energy balance that we just saw. And notice that they look kind of similar, but they've reached a steady state. They're no longer changing with time in about seven hours or so in both of these cases. The previous case, that was much, much longer before we reached that steady state. So let's think about how we might compare these solutions. Not surprisingly, as 
the ability to transport energy relative to what it takes to store energy goes up, we reach the energy is transported to the end of this bar much more quickly, raising the temperature at the end sooner and ultimately reaching a steady state much sooner. I'd like to think about non-dimensional time so that we can really compare these solutions. The thermal diffusivity has units of meters squared per second. And that means that if we divide a length scale squared divided by alpha, we'll get a dimension of time. From that, we can create a non-dimensional time. Alpha times T over L squared will have no dimensions, and it's a characterization of the non-dimensional time. In honor of Joseph Fourier, who contributed greatly to the development of the science of heat transfer, we've given this number the, a name of the Fourier number. The Fourier number alpha t over L squared is the non-dimensional time. Now if I plot both of these cases, the high thermal diffusivity and the lower thermal diffusivity, against the non-dimensional time, you notice that these solutions look identical. They both reach a steady state somewhere around a Fourier number of 15 or a non-dimensional time of 15. This is very useful because it means that we can get rid of the material properties in solving these problems. I could tabulate solutions for specific geometries which are independent of the material properties. Then if you wanted to use a copper bar instead of an aluminum bar, you could take that solution and infer and calculate exactly how it would behave in your different material. So it's very useful to use to, to apply clever uses of non-dimensionalization in order to minimize the work that we have to do and share our effort broadly with as many engineers as possible. I'm going to look quickly at a two-dimensional example. This is the example that I used in a couple of videos, including the uh, graphical method video. But what I have here is a two-dimensional slab of material, an aspect ratio of two. And I have a temperature of 100 degrees on the top surface, half of the top surface, and a temperature of 50 degrees on the bottom surface. Both of these sides are insulated. Now we're going to start with an initial condition where the entire bar is at 50, and immediately apply that boundary condition of 100 degrees. We watch, initially energy is coming in this north boundary and it's being stored, raising the temperature of this material. It's propagating through the entire material. You can see the insulated boundaries with the perpendicular contour lines to those boundaries. It's very interesting as it turns the corner as more is heated up and you start to see the contour line hit this boundary, always perpendicular. Once we get a temperature gradient at the south boundary, we have energy going out this boundary and less energy storage and eventually we'll reach the steady state where all of the energy that's coming in the north boundary is going out the south boundary. So we can look at that energy balance, of course. The energy balance without energy generation is E in minus E out is equal to E stored, or the rate of energy in minus the rate of energy out is equal to the rate that energy is stored. So I plotted all of those terms here, including the balance, which of course the balance is E in minus E out minus E stored, and so it should be zero to conserve energy. If we focus first on later times, we can see that initially there's significant energy into the north boundary, and that's going completely into the energy storage term. As we take a certain amount of time to propagate that energy storage or raising the temperature of the material to create a gradient at the south boundary, we start to see an increasing rate of heat transfer out the south boundary. As we approach our steady state, What's going out the south boundary comes approximately equal to what's coming in the north boundary. If we went a little bit further, those would be exactly equal. We're almost at the steady state. And the energy storage term, and the energy storage term is of course going to zero as we do that. You might notice also in this figure that at very early times, there's a problem with the energy conservation. And that's not really surprising. We could fix that by using smaller time steps and smaller uh, grid spacings to capture these gradients. But of course, it also comes about because of the unphysical initial condition. Initially, the whole bar is 50 and we immediately put the temperature to be 100 here. So we have an enormous gradient here, which would be very hard to see in reality. And very quickly, yeah, we start to see a solution that's very well behaved with respect to energy conservation. We'll often see in these problems that because our initial conditions are either unphysical un or approximations of the reality, that we have challenges in those early times. If we wish to, we can analyze that further using very, very fine meshes. But of course, the effect of that initial condition washes out fairly quickly, and you can study your problem a little bit away from that initial condition uh, just fine.